Thank you for being here very much, and Jane, thank you for inviting me here. Jane asked us to think about what it is that drives us, and when I began thinking about it, there were really three things that came to my mind, a discovery, a definition, and a defining moment. And I want to see if I can talk about all of those within 10 minutes. So let's start first with a discovery. Um, Bob referenced a study that the two of us did a couple of years ago with about 1,300 teachers, grades 4 through 12. And he pointed out to you that one of the things they told us is that kids are reading less than 30 minutes a week. I think some of you might have thought that was a day. A week in class nonfiction material and less than 10 pages a week of nonfiction material at home. We found that particular result very disturbing. But another thing we found is that when we asked teachers, how do you get the content to your students? The, the yellow down there represents a number that said through reading. Most of the teachers, especially our high school teachers, said their primary way of sharing content with students was through lecture and also through class discussion. Folks, that's very much a situation of oral, of oral curriculum. So that these kids, when they're going to college, I don't believe could be considered college and career ready, where the professor says, here's the book, go forth and read, because that's not how they're learning at school. Another question we asked the teachers was, where do you spend your time when you're looking at teaching struggling readers how to read your content? So social studies, science, math, language arts. Especially at high school, what we found, and I want you to look at the results, most teachers said we spend most of our time teaching kids just how to identify main idea and paraphrase it. Now this is when they're working with their struggling readers. I want you to look at how much time they said they spend offering kids um, the time to think about questioning the text. They spent a lot of time focusing on context clues and a little bit of time on recognizing text features. Kind of hold this in mind for a second and let's go to the next slide. And what we see here is when we said to those same teachers, where do you spend your time when you're working with highly skilled readers? Now look, they're talking about the author's point of view and making logical inferences. Do you see the difference there? One group of kids is taught how to find the main idea. Another group of kids is taught to about how to question the author. What you'll see here is I put them side by side so that you can really see the difference. And when we look at that, I'm seeing a curriculum that says to those who have least, we will keep you there. We will keep you there. And that if you have a lot, we'll give you that. It's called the Matthews effect. And we're surprised when it comes true that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. What we also saw is that when we looked in classrooms, we saw two different types of talk being used in the classroom. In our lowest performing classrooms, talk was used simply to check for understanding. In the higher performing classrooms, talk was used to create understanding. Talk that's used to, to check for understanding sounds like this. Boys and girls, who is the main character in The Giver? There's not a child in the room that looks up and says, oh my goodness, Ms. Beers doesn't know who it is, let me help her. They all know that I know and that I'm simply asking to see if you know. And most kids look at that kind of question and call it an inauthentic question. It's not a real question because you're not truly trying to figure out something. If you want to attach a, 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 a tier three vocabulary word to it, that's much more monologic talk. But in our higher performing classrooms, what we see is much more of the opportunity to create understanding, which is much more of that dialogic talk. And when we have dialogic talk, then kids are in charge, their sentence structure is more complex, and they are the ones who are figuring out everything. What we begin to see is that we have a segregation in school of intellectual rigor that is every bit as shameful as segregation by color. Because in too many classrooms across this nation, when we walk into our lowest performing classrooms, that's where we find our students of color. 
And when I walk in and the, those students in those classrooms are asked the lowest level questions, I wonder how are they ever supposed to move to the very highest level. Let's talk for a moment about another thing driving my thinking right now, which is a definition. I want you, if you would, please turn to the person next to you and please say the first two words that come to your mind when you think of the word literacy. Turn to your partner and say the first two words. <laughs> Let's come back together. If you would now please all say aloud the first word that came to your mind. Go. Yeah. Those of you that didn't say reading, you're messing up my study. Just <laughs> We're going to call you an outlier for um, research and we'll just dismiss you. You know what I heard a lot of, because I'm using selective hearing right now, it works well, was the word reading. How many of you said reading? Let's see that. Yeah, a lot of hands. Now, what I don't know is what your second word would be. It might be writing. It might be thinking. I can't usually predict the second word, but I'm almost always positive that the first word will be reading. Folks, I think it's time we consider a new definition for literacy, which is kind of new. I mean, that's not new. We've done that. At one point in this country, you were literate if you could sign your name. And that time in our history was called signature literacy. As a matter of fact, you didn't even have to sign your name. You only needed to be able to put what? An X. And at that moment, we began to look and see that there's something about literacy that is always tied to power. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to suggest to you the first two words we ought to think of are the words power and privilege. I want you to think what your language arts classrooms, your social studies classrooms, your science classrooms might look like if instead of reading and writing being the first two words we think of in the 21st century, we instead think of power and privilege. That when kids are empowered, they are in charge of their learning. They understand that with that power comes great privilege. We know that when the privilege is used to the betterment, people go anywhere. And when it is used poorly, you have things like the terrible racist chant from the college boys at the University of Oklahoma. With that power comes great privilege. And it is our obligation to make sure those children become ethical and responsible citizens who use that power and that privilege. When we think about power, Frank Smith, back in the 60s, told us that power really in a literate environment has three parts to it. First off, you are able to understand complex messages. Folks, if we don't let kids read their content in classrooms, I'm not sure how they're ever supposed to learn to understand those complex messages. The second part of power is that you know how to share that message with others. And Frank Smith told us the third part of power is that ability to rally others around your message. He said this long before there was this thing called Twitter. And this thing called Twitter now has proved that true because power in this day and age is no longer about money. It is about how many followers you have. And that's about being able to offer a message that others want to hear. So I think that what happens is that when we are in a classroom, we want to make sure that students develop intellectual standards that open them up to possibilities, new and challenging ideas that offer and give them the courage and resilience to change their minds when they see persuasive reasons to do so. And eventually what we want is children who can think, who can think critically to help our democracy. Thank you so much. Nothing.